Good morning. Thank you so much for the invitation to come and talk to you this morning. And that piece that you've just heard is the most wonderful lead-in to what I'm talking about today. It appears I'm using the principles of what you've described, of co-production. What was it, appreciative inquiry, if I got that term right? I didn't know that's what it was called. I'm supposed to be an academic, but there you go. Um, but that's very much underpinning what we're trying to do with the national strategy. Now, what I'm told, I spend a lot of my time talking to tissue viability nurse. I'm a bit excited about this, because I'm told you're, a, you're all sorts. Is that fair enough? Any practice nurses? Oh, no. Yes, great. District nurses? Students? Some students, nursing homes, yeah, all sorts of people. Hospital nurses, I'm assuming, as well. I put my cards on the table. I'm a community nurse. I, I didn't thrive in a hospital environment. I kept asking questions, and in those days, you got into trouble. But anyway, <laughs> it seemed to turn out all right in the end. What I would say is um, my background is most of my career has been as a clinician. That's what I do. But very early on in my clinical career, I walked into a university and said, why aren't you teaching us about this, that, and the other? And I got scooped up and used, still in a clinical role, but to work with researchers. I then went on to teach. And it appears I'm now in a policy position, which is a learning curve like that for me. But what I would say is the patient is utterly at the heart of everything I do. And very, very closely by that, followed by that, is the clinicians like yourselves who work with these patients. Because that's what matters, isn't it? So what we are trying to do is trying to improve wound care um, for patients and to help you deliver the best possible care um, to the right patient at the right time. So what have we got? Haha, it works, always a relief. Right, now, you may not be familiar with this, some of you may be. About a couple of years ago, a paper was published, which is generally known as the Burden of Wounds publication. Now, those of us who've worked in this field for a long time, and I've worked since my first day as a community staff nurse, when I walked in, I saw the worst pair of legs I've ever seen. I think there's only one pair that have come close to it since. And I couldn't believe nobody knew what to do, because I didn't know what to do. And that's where my passion came from. And those of us who've worked in this field for a long time have been arguing that wound care is really, really important. And I'm guessing you agree with me, which is why you're here today. But we've just been ignored. And then a couple of years ago, this publication came out by Julian Guest um, and colleagues. And it estimated that in 2012 to 13, which is what, five years ago now? More? More than five years. The NHS cost is roughly between 4.5 to 5.1 billion. That is huge. And that's probably not a surprise to those of you in the field. As a district nurse, they estimate about half our time is taken up on wound care. So I wasn't surprised by this. But what did the politicians set up and took notice? And because that is the same cost as the cost of obesity, and we all know that obesity is a huge problem which is being tackled, suddenly wound care was on the agenda. Even more scarily, a, a paper published last year is if we don't improve wound care, these costs are likely to increase by more than 50% for an average board. And as you all know, the NHS is, and I presume nobody's working in an organisation that has spare money kicking around. Is that fair to say? <laughs> Nobody thinks, oh, what shall I do next? I've got nothing to do. We all know we're flat out. So we cannot afford this increase. Something has to be done. I have to say, in the last 12 months, I've got a new respect for the House of Lords. Um, because they have very much driven this initiative forward. So I'm very grateful to various people in the House of Lords who've been asking the challenging questions of the government. Why are we not doing anything about this? So things are happening. Things are happening. The National Wound Care Strategy Programme has been funded initially for 12 months. And it sounds awfully grand, but basically it's me plus a program manager part-time, plus a bit of admin, plus you lot. So you are my people. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny, you are my people. I have so far recruited between about 80 and 100 um, experts at the top of their field. We're talking about professors in surgery, professors of nursing, podiatrists heading royal colleges, things like that, tissue viability nurses, leads in health education England, leads for primary care. I have gone out, nursing homes, I've got the lead people from nursing homes as well. You name it, I want them on my table because they're my people. But they're not just my people, they're the people I'm working with immediately, but you're my people too and I really need you as well and I explain as I go through what I need from you, please. Always talk, brought up to say please and thank you. <laughs> I won't say thank you till you've done it, but <laughs> I will say please. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to scope a national wound care strategy to improve care. We are only at this stage looking at three principal areas. 
pressure ulcers, lower limb ulcers, surgical wounds. And the reason for this is these are the areas which are, caught, which are the most problematic at the moment. Now, I know there are other areas as well. I mean, I've got a bit of a thing about fungating wounds, but they are relatively rare. So it's not that we're not interested, but they're not on the list of priorities. God willing, if we're successful, things like that will come on. But that's the reason why we're looking at these three. We're trying to establish the underlying clinical and economic for, case for change. What do we need to do to improve care and how could we go about doing this? So very much a follow-on, as I say, from what Jenny's talked about. And we want to develop recommendations that can be carried out in practice to improve care. So what are the principles that underpin this programme? We think one of the problems is that wound care shouldn't be viewed as a separate clinical issue, but be integrated into the care of all the underlying comorbidities. You'll be aware that wounds don't, don't usually just arise from one thing. They're usually an indication of something going on underneath. So it's like arterial disease, venous disease, diabetes. And so we can't think of it in a silo. We've got to look more broadly than that. And I think that might be one of the problems we've had so far. We don't fit into one medical speciality. It's broader. So what we're trying to do is bring that together, get rid of that silo thinking, because it's not helpful. It is a long-term commitment. I said at the beginning, we've only got funding until September. But there's a very, very strong chance we're going to get funded beyond that. And frankly, even if we don't, we've made enough mates in useful places now that this is going to carry on. So don't think this is going to stop in September and I might just shut up and go away because I won't. And Jenny definitely won't because she's even more, well, she's younger. She's got more energy than me. <laughs> but, you know, we've got this next generation coming along. This is not something which is time limited. This is a long-term programme. And in fact, the policymakers, the senior policymakers, are talking about this being a certainly three to five years, probably five to ten year program that needs to go on. Pray God I've retired by then, but who knows? I might be needing the care, who knows? <laughs> Slightly selfish in making sure we get this better. <laughs> as I said, this is not about being the responsibility of one particular professional group. I think, and I speak as, a TV, as an ex-TVN myself, tissue viability nurse myself, I think one of the things we may have not done well enough in the past is work outside the silo of tissue viability nursing. You know, there's a ve you've got some brilliant tissue viability nurses in the country, but we, we need to be working with people on the ground and we need to be spreading that message. Some of that has been because we've been fighting for existence to actually get ourselves to that point, but it's definitely time to move forward and to work with that. I mean, one of the pleasures I've had, I've, I'm working with um, pro professors of surgery. Now, if you ask me one of the most scary groups in the NHS, I would have said professors of surgery. But professors of surgery who are interested in wounds are a fascinating bunch, and so far have been absolutely charming. So, you know, let's put, as you say, those biases to one side. And actually, we all want to do things better. How can we do it better? And as I said at the beginning, key priority is the patient. The patient is central to this. So we've got this year planning, and then we, well, so then we start implementing. You'll be aware there are some things that are already being implemented. I thought it'd be helpful just to get, I know this is a bit policy, but I think if you understand how the whole lot fits together, you'll understand what your ro potential role is in this. So what have we got? We've got a strategy board which oversees the whole thing. And on that, it's being chaired by Baroness Watkins, who is a nurse, who would have thought it? She's a mental health nurse, but she knows enough about healthcare and she's interested in wound care, even though it's not a speciality. So we've got somebody leading us who really does understand our world. There's me there, obviously. Ruth May, you may have heard of Ruth May, chief nurse. Yeah, familiar name, I would hope. But we've also got people involved um, who are like Health Education England. Some of you may have heard about the GERFT program, which is the Get It Right First Time program, which is from NHS Improvement. So we've got some really high level policy people there. Because frankly, if you don't have those people, you're not gonna get heard. So it's very important we've got engagement there. I'm gonna go through the square and circle in more detail and the triangle in a bit more detail. But what we've got feeding into that board on the left-hand side are three clinical work streams, which I'll go through in some more detail, and four enabler groups to help make this happen. I'll explain how that's happening. And then on the right, we've got these, this triangle of forums, and this is where you come in, and I'm going to tell you how to get involved in that. One thing I didn't say at the beginning, I probably should have said, 
This is a national strategy for England, because obviously that's the way our country is divided up at the moment. Having said that, we are linking up with Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland, because why wouldn't you? So they, what we come out with will be a recommendation for what happens in England, but we are listening and talking to the other countries as well, so that we share. We might as well share from each other. So, responsibilities of the clinical work streams. As you can see, we've got pressure ulcers, lower limb, and surgical wounds. So what's their role? We're looking at the evidence base to try and assess the current relevant re re not research evidence mainly, but not entirely. We will then be making evidence-informed recommendations to come up with what should we be doing? How can we change practice to make it better? And we also will be identifying the questions where actually we don't actually know what to do because the evidence doesn't yet exist. There's an awful lot of those. But the reality is if you're at the coalface delivering care, you've got to do something, haven't you? But it would be really nice to at least start with what is most likely to work, which the research tells us what is most likely to work. But if there's no evidence there to tell you at all, you're stuffed. And so we need to actually make sure we start to identify where those gaps are so we can get funding to do that research so in some years' time we will have a bit more knowledge. The responsibility of the enabler work streams, which are education and workforce, research evidence, data and information, supply and distribution, is to support that. As I say, I will go through that in a bit more detail. And then the stakeholder council. We have one for suppliers, industry, one for health and care professionals, which I'm guessing is probably most of you. Have we got any patients in the room? I don't know if we've got any patients, but there is one for patients. And I really need your help with recruiting to the patient one because, it's, as you'll know, it's more difficult. And we talk, you mentioned co-production. We are really, really trying to get the patient voice in what we are, well, patient choice as well, into what we're developing. So please, if you have patients that you think would be interested, we would love them to sign up. You know, it's not just you that needs to sign up to help us. We need them as well. So if you know anybody you think might be interested, give, let them know how they can have their voice. So that was just to remind you, because if, if you were like me, I'd have got forgotten how it all fits together. <laughs> okay. Pressure ulcers are well known about. It's interesting, actually. Pressure ulcers are only estimated to be about 7% of the total wound burden. But we know it's... So they've had a lot of attention. And at the moment, um, you'll be aware, I'm guessing a lot of you will be aware, I hope most of you are aware, of Stop the Pressure campaign. Yeah? Some of you know of React to Red, which is being carried out in the nursing homes. Yep, some of you, great. What we're trying to do is bring that work together and fit it with the National Wound Claim Strategy Programme. That is a bit of a work in progress at the moment. I can't give you the exact details of that, but conversations are ongoing, and we're trying to coordinate what is happening there. So that's a body of work I'm guessing a lot of you are familiar with that will be coming part of, is expected to become part of the um, National Programme. But so at the moment, there are some discussions ongoing as how that's going to happen. What has happened so far, though, is certainly Stop the Pressure and React to Red have already brought together, which just seems sensible. And some of you, are you aware that any of you in education, there is a pressure ulcer core curriculum, which is actually jolly handy. So if you're not aware of that, go and have a look on Stop the Pressure. It's a good piece of work. The lower limb work stream is making, pardon the pun, but huge strides. Um, it's, this is the area I think we can probably make the most difference fastest because it's been totally neglected, but we actually have a halfway decent evidence base that tells us what we should be doing, but we're not doing it. Now, interestingly, I think most of the improvement we're going to get is actually about getting our services better organized. I don't think products are the issue particularly. The problem is getting the, the right care to the right patient, not the right product on the patient. There's very good products out there, but they're not going to be a miracle cure. What's going to make the difference is getting that diagnosis done far earlier so that you get the patient into the right care. Um, it's, the guest paper is fascinating on this topic. Um, there's, I think, only about half of, it might be less than that, only uh, about half of people with a wound, a leg ulcer, actually get a diagnosis. Well, you can't treat a leg ulcer unless you know what the underlying cause is. So you've got a problem. We've got to do something about getting people diagnosed earlier. My own father-in-law got a leg I'm allowed to talk about him. Um, he, got a leg, he got a leg ulcer following cardiac surgery. It took me six months to persuade the GP to stop prescribing antibiotics and get him to somebody who could do a Doppler. Now, if I can't do that for my own father-in-law, and this was in an area where I knew there were good tissue viability services, but I could not get from there to there. If I can't do that, what's it like for somebody who doesn't know what to ask for? 
We have got to do something about this. We really have. But the really good thing, of course, particularly most of the wounds are venous leg ulcers. Venous leg ulcers, we have a damn good evidence base. We need to get them into compression, and we don't need to tickle them with compression. We need to get proper therapeutic compression, not just a sort of a, you know, Ooh, that'll do. We need proper therapeutic compression, and we need it to be done by people who are confident and know what they're doing, and we need that skill set there to be able to do it. So I think that's probably the area we get most on. Well, the other one that's interesting, actually, is the diabetic foot, well, the foot ulcers. I didn't know until recently there are as many people with foot ulcers without diabetes as there are with diabetes. And you've got this two-tier service. It doesn't make sense, does it? It's like the cancer with lymphedema. Thank God, if you, you know, if you get, if you get lymphedema, you're usually much better off if you've got cancer, which is ironic, isn't it, than if you've just got lymphedema. We've got to do something about these discrepancies. They don't make clinical sense. Joining things up. Um, so that's a big body of work. And again, to motivate you to sign up to help, I fully expect that group to be sending something out to the forums in the next probably a couple of weeks asking for your opinions. And, and as Jenny referred to, we are, we are doing blue sky thinking. I don't want you to look at it and think, well, we can't do that. Of course you can't do it. You haven't got the service yet, but would you like to do it? Do you think it's a good idea? That's what we want you to say. Because if you think this is the way to go, then we stand a much better chance of getting change done at commissioning level. That's what we've got to be working to. Surgical wounds, this is interesting. Um, I think it's all interesting. Uh, surgical wounds, obviously the ones, it's not all surgical wounds, because the ones that they stitch up and they get better, no problem. The trouble with surgical wounds is when they dehiss, when they break down, sometimes they're left deliberately open, but they're the ones that take the time and cause the misery for patients and loads of work. And the surgeons didn't realize until relatively recently, they assumed that if patients are discharged and don't come back, they've healed. But those of us who work in the community know these, things, these wounds could go on for weeks and months and months. But trying to get a patient back, and the surgeons would love to have them back because they want to know, but there's just been this disconnect again. So we are looking at what we can do to come up with recommendations, how we can improve that situation. That will probably be a slow bit of work because there's not as much evidence there to guide us. And also the lower limb work stream is far further down the road. Some of you will have heard of the Legs Matter campaign. So, you know, that, that was a ready form group. We've added some extra people in, but generally they were well on their way. The surgical wounds is, is slower. But we're working with GERFT, with Get It Right First Time. They're doing some work around surgical site infection audits. So we're starting to, to get moving there, to get traction, but it is slower. The research work stream, I basically went out and begged every senior researcher I knew in the country, in England, and there may be some I've missed, it's not meant to offend, just please, if you're interested, make yourselves known, and have asked them to support us. They cannot do original research because they have not got the resource and time, but these guys are really good at knowing what's already out there and critically evaluating the quality. Because some of those of you who work with research know, not all randomized control trials, for example, are created equal. You can have a <laughs> so we need to know what's the good work that we can actually trust the answers and where are their problems and also where are their gaps. So they are, they are being enormously helpful and the Cochrane Wounds Group is closely involved with that. But it's not just Cochrane, it's way beyond that as well. The data and information work stream is being led by Anne Jacqueline, who some of you may have come across some of the Carter work around this. One of the problems we had, and even with the guest paper, it was, I shouldn't really say it, but it was a guesstimate in the end, because, or, um, because we don't have reliable data. So how do you know if you're getting better if you can't trust the data on where you're at at the moment? So what we're trying to do is come up with a set of metrics that will not put additional burden on you, because I said at the beginning, I bet you're busy, but metrics that we can gather from what you already have that will tell us if things are improving. I suspect we will need some extras, but we, trust me, we are trying to make those as burden light, burden light? It's the opposite to burdensome, um, as light as possible, because we need the data, but we don't want to be gathering more data than we have to, because every bit of data, you, this is me as a researcher, every bit of data you gather has a cost. So I do not want any more cost from information gathering than we need, but we do need some, and we need it to be the right stuff, and we need it to be gathered in a way that doesn't stop you doing the clinical care. So that's what we're working towards. It's, it's a challenge, it's a huge challenge, because there's all these codes, and they're not always terribly helpful, but we're limited by them, but we're working on it. 
Then the education and workforce works, Jim, and I think this is the one that's going to be doing probably most work. Obviously, we need education. If you don't know what you're doing, you can't do it. But I don't think education alone is the issue. Now, one of the problems we have is, as I said earlier, you're all really busy people. So what we're looking at is developing online bite-sized learning that is free to access to everybody. So if you're running a nursing home and you've got your new nurses and you want to update them on this, you will be able to direct them to somewhere that actually has online education that you trust. That's our vision. We did talk about blue sky thinking. We're also trying to make it easy for those of you who want to go on and do post trade qualifications, try and just making a list of the universities that offer this stuff so you haven't got to try and work it out for yourself. Let's try and keep a list that's reasonably up to date that helps you work out where you can go for help. I was a tissue viability nurse. I was also an educator in a university. I taught undergraduates. These bite-sized online learning charts would have been brilliant for me because I could have just said to my student nurses, right, go and do this, then come back to the classroom for an hour or two with me and we'll start applying it to clinical practice. We'll talk, we'll talk through some scenarios. But we're trying to make things as easy and as high quality for you as possible. So the education group are working on that at the moment. The workforce group have got a real challenge because I said earlier, I think the biggest way we're going to get change is by reorganizing our workforce so that we allows you to do the job you need to do. So I was a district nurse, I'm of a certain age, so quite a few of my friends who are district nurses have gone on to become nurse practitioners, practice nurses, senior roles in general practice. They are utterly frustrated because they do not get the time or they do not have the equipment to be able to do. They know what to do, but they're working in a situation that doesn't allow them to do it. And also, my, my, my doctoral work was in judgment and decision making. If you're going to become good at something, you need the opportunity for feedback, i.e., am I doing this right? And you need to be able to do it repeatedly. Now, if you're working in a nursing home, yes, you could learn to Doppler, but actually, unless it's an absolute this is a mammoth, mammoth. No, it's not going to happen, is it? You're not going to get the opportunity to do it frequently enough to keep your skills up. So we've got to think of another way of doing this. It's not fair on you to say, well, just go and get a Doppler. That doesn't make sense. We've got to think about reorganizing our services. So that's what we'll be talking about with the workforce. We also need to open our mind, talking about biases. Um, we need to think about who else can do this. We're not saying they should do it, but who else could? For example, I... I was in a meeting yesterday and we were talking about compression hosiery and I happened to be sitting next to a professor of pharmacy. And I've got really interested in the role of the pharmacy technicians, registered group. And I'm thinking it would have been brilliant if when I prescribed 40 millimeters of mercury hosiery to somebody, rather than me having to work out if there was somebody who actually knew all the different types of hosiery, could take this patient and work out what might work best for them. Because although it's standard, it's not that standard, is it? We all know that some have thicker elastic, thinner elastic, and all our legs are different. Brilliant job for a pharmacy technician to take responsibility for maybe being the expert in hosiery. And that would be really helpful to me as a senior nurse, and a much more cost-effective way of doing it. So we not think creatively about what are the options. Supply and distribution. Now, this is, this is looking at product. It's looking at the right product, right time, right patient, all that stuff. There is a load of work going on about how do we actually try and rationalize what is happening. What I will say is we are not looking to reduce what is available to you. That is not our concern. But what we're concerned about is, is it of good enough quality if it says it does something in addition to just, or even if, it's, if it says it's really good at soaking up exudate, is it? <laughs> you know? And are we able to purchase it at a price that is acceptable to both industry and ourselves? We are not, I mean, there will have been, you may have heard some rumors about we're going to cut it down. You'll only be allowed a piece of gauze if you're lucky on a Thursday. That is not, <laughs> that is not where we're going. None of us want to go back to a world where we had, I mean, I'm old enough to remember some of the very limited before the modern dressings came in. We don't want to go back to that. I never want to be picking gauze out of a patient's wound again. It's awful for them and it's pretty awful for me as well. But we do need to have a system that means that we are paying, because ultimately we're paid by the taxpayers, and you'll all be, well, students won't be, most of you will be taxpayers. You want value for money. You want money to be used properly. I don't want to sabotage the, um, the um, suppliers. We have a very healthy pharma industry in this country. Competition is good. So I don't want to be held as the woman single-handedly responsible for destroying that industry. But at the same time, I have a duty to patients, carers, 
so patients, nurses and taxpayers. So we want good quality products and we want them at an appropriate price. So that needs sorting, but we are not looking to reduce. I don't want everybody to have to go and rewrite their formularies. That's not the vision. But it is about getting the right thing in the right time. So there's a huge body of work there. I am reassured that what is being proposed is sensible but please be patient because there is a lot of consultation going on and you may hear some rumours, so don't necessarily believe the rumours is what I'm saying. It's really what, what I'm speaking directly to the quality assurance people. We are working very closely together and what is being proposed is sensible and to my ear seems fair. And I'm a very fair, I try to be a very fair person. So just be patient on that front. Now, the stakeholder forums, and this is where you come in. Um, you can try and copy that down, because that's what I'd love you to all sign up with if you, you've clearly got an interest in wound care. But if you, if you can't get that to work or it's too complicated, if you just Google National Wound Care Strategy Programme, you should find our web page. And I bullied our IT girl last night to say, you have to get at the top about how to sign up to the stakeholder forums. And I checked it this morning. Couldn't get it to work on my laptop, don't know why. But it definitely worked on my phone. So I think it was just a glitch with my laptop rather than it not working. Please, please just say, just Google wound, National Wound Care Program. It will, it will, at the top it says how to sign up to stakeholder forums. And I'm guessing most of you, some of you, some will be from industry in this room, um, you can't sign up with all of them. Choose the one most appropriate. So basically, if you work for industry, you would sign up with the supplier forum. If you're a clinician um, providing patient, direct patient care, health and care professionals. And it doesn't need to be just registered nurses. If you're working with OTs, physios, whoever, um, care home staff, you know, they don't need to be registered nurses, but who are interested in this topic, get them to sign up. And as I said earlier, if you're working with patients, we really, really want patients to sign up. So please encourage them. They always show the one at the bottom, don't they? Your country needs you. But I found a female version. I thought, let's get the women on here as well, given we are primarily a female occupation. I really believe we can do this. I really think we can. We ca I cannot do it alone. I need your help. I need your blue sky thinking. I need your passion. I need your commitment. I need you to make a noise. I need you to make demands and say, this isn't good enough and it needs to change. And I need you to be making supportive comments. That doesn't mean you need to agree with everything we propose, but please don't go out there to bash us. We want to listen. We are trying to do the right thing. We, I promise you we will listen. I can't promise you I'll always agree because I'm an academic, I argue, that's what I do. <laughs> but I do listen to reason and I can be persuaded, as can my colleagues. So please engage in the debate, share your thoughts with us, and please get involved. Thank you very much. <laughs>